made it to four o'clock on a Friday. Well done for sticking around with your truly dedicated education. Uh, right, so the whole of this session is going to be based around uh, one note. This isn't going to be a super deep dive into all the technical uh, areas, but what it's going to be is it's going to be a real surface overview of uh, some of the new features that have come out with one note over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's going to give you an idea about how to best organize uh, your classroom using the uh, incredible power of OneNote. Um, this, this presentation has been done by, by a, an American colleague of mine for the last couple of days, and I've just been the one wandering around in the wonderful cave being a helper. Um, I now have one wonderful helper in a building cave. If you are having a struggle with anything, Mr. Crawford's going to help me, aren't I? So lucky. Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, come on, what we're going to do is if you have any issues with your OneNote, just put your hand up, give a look to one of the wonderful gentlemen, and they'll just come and help you and, and sort it out. So I'm going to steal something from my American colleague that I think I would do one for when I was in the bathroom. I don't know if you've known about Fist 45 or Fist 25, but what it does is if you know absolutely nothing about OneNote, then show me this. If you know absolutely everything and you're here to take my job and do the presentation yourself, give me five. If you're somewhere between, give me an indication of what you know so far about OneNote, this to five. We've got some threes matching up with my expertise. I'm gonna go for a four, ambitious. I see some fours and I see a couple of just zeros as well. Wonderful, hopefully everybody's gonna get something out of this. There's been some wonderful new features I'm gonna touch upon. Um, but I think first and foremost, what is OneNote? Uh, there's plenty of definitions I could be giving it, but I think the best way to talk about OneNote um, is it's a digital binder. It, it brings everything that you do within that classroom experience, everything that you've been running to the photocopier to do the uh, first thing on a Monday morning. Uh, it brings it all into one place. It's an incredible collaboration space for students and teachers to collaborate together, students to collaborate with one another, and also teachers to share best practice and share their resources between each other. It's, uh, it's a phenomenal resource. I think the definition that I give it is it's the greatest app you could possibly hope for as an educator working in the classroom. It's an incredible way of bringing everything that you do within the classroom into the 21st century and making your place a really transformative and digital arena. A lot of this is going to be incredibly hands-on. You have some beautiful devices in front of you today, a whole load of OEMs and also some services knocking around. What I'd encourage you to do is I encourage you to open up the OneNote app. You could open it up in 2016, you could open up the Windows 10 app, you could open it up in a browser. If you go to office.com, you'll also see the office bottle, give it a click. But I would really suggest you open up OneNote and have a look. Okay. So you may land on a page and you may have a load of different things, but what you're going to be looking for is at the very, very top, it needs to say, Miss. Bowman's fourth grade All Stars Notebook. That's what it needs to say. That's where all the content we're going to be discussing and playing around with today is going to be located. So try and navigate well to that notebook, and that'll be a good start. Now, hopefully, you're going to have some pens around you as well. Something that's changed massively in the last couple of years is the touch devices and incredible digitizers. If you've got a pen in front of you, marvelous. If you've got a figure on your hand, also marvelous. Give it a poke, give it a wiggle around. These are touchscreen devices, the vast majority of them. Interact in as many different ways as you see fit. Now we're going to have a look at the inking capabilities. So what I'm going to do is, first and foremost, I want you to go into this area here. And on welcome, underneath there, you're going to find the page making 12. Give it a click and have a little look. You should see the same things that are currently on my screen. Now within one word, you can have a multimodal input. So you have the ability to use text if you wish to type in. You can start using your finger on the screen, you can use a stylus, you can use a pen. If you're using the Lenovo 300 and new devices launch, you can actually use a graphite pencil on the screen as well and it will still have the input. You can put in various different things. If you'd like to explore the different ways that you can insert and input things into a window, have a look at your insert tab. You're going to see a whole load of different things that you can actually bring into this fantastic digital binder. Things like audio clips, videos, online videos, embedded Office 365 documents, hyperlinks, meetings, different forms, images. You can bring in a whole load of different things, but the thing that I want you to really focus on is the use of touch, the use of a pen, the use of a finger on the screen. I have wonderful helpers running around with different styluses and pens at the moment. Really play around with that input and enjoy it. Now, inking is incredibly important. There's a whole host of studies. I don't have the name of the reference materials in front of me right now, but the level of retention when students are actually using multimodal input, when they're using pin and digital inking capabilities, is wonderful, wonderful for their learning and their retention of information. So, I'm going to show you a few different pieces now. I also want to show you uh, this piece of world news here. Now, often in my classroom experience, what we do is we try and use uh, current affairs 
recent things that have happened with the news as a way to inspire and engage our students. And that's something that's quite difficult if you start sending them out to the internet to go and find web stories. They're going to find pop-ups, they're going to get distracted, and they're going to go onto YouTube and start watching highlight videos instead. The best thing you can do here is you just get the OneNote print to OneNote built in, uh, extended to your browser. And then one click, you can just print it to OneNote, These and that means you send that entire web page out. directly into your OneNote. So what's happened here? Is this wonderful article from May 23rd has now been printed into the OneNote. The students can now read it and interact with it. Oh, they can oh, highlight, right they can circle, they can so do this. Good. I can see a few people getting yeah, rather good. frustrated that they're unable to fiddle with it, and I'm going to explain yeah. why. Now, this is a document that sits within the welcome space. This is the welcome space of our digital binder. This is a place where I'm welcoming and I'm showing things. This isn't a place where seven-year-olds can start scribbling on things and writing notes. This isn't a place for them to do the collaboration. I'm going to give you a clue where they may do some collaboration. But right now, this is a welcome. So if you want to start doing your inputs, please feel free to jump ahead into a different space. I will get there, but if you can't wait, please feel free to go and select an area in the collaboration space and start scribbling and drawing. Now within the welcome space, we've also got the poetry. Now this is a fantastic piece. When I was in the classroom, a huge amount of what I did was doing a lot, a lot of marking, a lot of feedback, using certain kinds of ink, certain kinds of feedback, following a wonderful strict marking criteria set by my school. Now this is a wonderful way of doing marking. This is a piece of work submitted through the one class over, and what you're able to do is you can do any kind of marking you want. The most wonderful piece of marking that I've seen recently, tweeted out by an educator from the States, is what they did is a huge piece of creative writing. They wanted to give incredibly rich feedback. They were on a train at the time. They're trying to do wonderful cursive writing with a pen to demonstrate best handwriting practice to students. It's completely impractical when you're on a train. So what they did instead is they just used the insert audio function. So under every single piece of creative writing, after they'd read it, they just pressed insert audio, and then they recorded just a 25 to 30 second piece of feedback for the student, and just said, look, this is a wonderful, wonderful piece of writing. I'm really enjoying it, especially this way you're using it at the moment in these clauses. I really like it. Could you possibly work on this in the future? It takes 10 to 15 seconds for the teacher to say it, but if they would have to write that in every single book individually, it extends. That's two, three minutes. That's saving three or four minutes per piece of marking. When you're marking 120 books a night, that's 480 minutes of marking. That is a huge difference it can make. But also, that feedback you're giving is so much more rich. It's so rich. It's something that they're really going to engage with. When you write this massive block of text to the students, you may have taught them one or two things about reading that feedback, but maybe they're going to look at the bottom. What is the mark that you've got? What tasks have you set me? What have I done wrong? If you leave them that wonderful audio note, they engage with it. They are much more likely to go back to it and improve what they actually do. Now within this, leaving these audio instructions. Now it's fantastic at trying to leave the audio instructions in here for students, but one of the things that I've seen educators use is when they have a supply teacher coming in, when they're having to be outside of the classroom and they're just thinking, I'm not too sure who this supply coming in is, it's not the normal supply, this lesson is going to be really, really difficult, I want them to get across. All the teachers done, hold down, insert audio note. They've then left the instructions for their class. They've left two or three minutes of input just to let the class know what's expected of them during that lesson class, open up the notebook, beginning the lesson, brand new teacher in front of them, and the instruction is, listen to the instruction, click on it, it's just the teacher that's left in the note. But what you could also do is all those kind and reassuring words that we say to our students, the ones that we're worried about, the ones that come across as quite vulnerable, the things we say to reassure them during the lesson, go into that person's binder, only they can see it, hold down the audio note. Tom, I know this is a piece of maths you haven't done yet, I'm sorry that I'm not here to help you through it. Have a really good go, I'm super proud of you and I'll see you tomorrow, best of luck. The ability to give that reassurance to a student can be a massive, massive difference. Having that audio input function can save you just a huge amount of time and make a much more personal learning experience for your students as well. Now within OneNote, because this is part of your Office 365 package, because this is a place where you can bring together everything that you do within the digital realm in Office 365, you have the ability to bring in PowerPoints and other things that you hold within your OneDrive and your SharePoint. Now in this example here, this is a PowerPoint slide deck that's been dropped in. Now if you were presenting this to the class, you are the one that dictates when they're done reading. You're the one that dictates when it's time for them to move on. You're the one that dictates which part of the thing that they can read at one point. If you start dropping a slide deck in here, it could be a read-only document. They have no ability to edit it, but what they can do is they can go through and explore that slide deck in a way that suits them, go to the bit that they need for this piece of work, and you give them the autonomy to take control of their learning. So rather than putting their hand up and saying, look, I saw something on slide three that was really important, but I can't quite remember what it was, they now have the power to just go and explore that themselves. You're giving them the ability, and you're giving them the empowerment to go and take control of their learning. It's a very, very good way of doing it. Now this is the content library. 
Think of the content library as a wonderful final fact where you're going to keep absolutely everything that you could possibly need in your classroom. Every worksheet, every resource you've ever had, every little guide. This is where you keep everything that you want. So all of those worksheets you created a long time ago that are stuck in a folder somewhere, this is where you can put them. This is a full content library. And this can now be shared with the students and they can access what they need at what point. And from here, when it's within this content library, within a couple of clicks, you're able to just click on the worksheet, distribute it to the class, and what will then happen is it will just appear with every single other member of the class. Now, I haven't already told you this, but you are all currently my students. You are all pupils within my classroom. I have the teacher twice, you have the students. So these are all the students down the side here. This is what the teacher can see. And have a look at the side of what you've got. You just have one name. And Spoiler alert, that is your pupil name, that is the pupil that you are today. You can only see what's in yours, whereas I can drop into anybody and I can see exactly what they're doing within their workspace. Now within this we have a load of different problems. They can be maths problems, they can be history problems, they can be math skills from geography and they can also be poetry. And what you can do is you can use this to push these out to students so they can have it. So what you can do is you can just tell the students, right, the only thing that I want you to see at is the thing that's just appeared in your, in your digital notebook. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send it through to you. And you can give it a click. So what I'll do here is I'll demonstrate how that works. So up here I click on my class notebook. Now you're not going to be able to see this because you're all students and I'm the teacher. But if you have your teacher account set up, you go to your class notebook. And this is where you get the opportunity to share things with your students. So we have a page distribution. We also have a section distribution. We can copy content to the library. So from here, I've loaded up this page. If I click distribute page, what it'll then give me an opportunity to do is to show me who it is that I want to send this page to. So in terms of creating the worksheet, you create the worksheet within this, and instead of hitting that print button and wasting a load of the school's money on a photocopy and sending it through to the printer and then having to make your way down to the printer and then find it's been jammed and, and someone else has cancelled the print job before you and someone's got there, they've taken half your worksheets because they thought they were part of theirs. Instead, what you do is you just create it, click the student page, and you can send that out to all of the pupils within the class. Two clicks, and it's already in front of every single member of the class for them to interact with. You can also distribute new sections. So let's say you're working on topics. When you come to the end of one topic, and all the work has been distributed within that section, you can start a brand new topic, distribute a new section, and then everything that you then push into there is part of that new section. Students don't have the ability to remove things from there. That is a teacher thing. So you can push out a piece of work, and it then remains in their digital binder, or any portfolio that you can see. Now, immersive reader is something that I desperately want to show you. Fist five, immersive reader. How unfair are we with various aspects of immersive reader? I love seeing fists when I talk about immersive reader because I know that I'm going to add a huge amount of value now to your classroom and you're going to make a wonderful learning experience for your pupils. So, immersive reader is part of our learning tools. It is a phenomenal uh, uh, piece of software and a toolkit that is built across a huge amount of the Office 365 platform. Uh, you will find it in various aspects, you will find it in Edge. I'm going to show you a table later showing you where you can find it, but within OneNote, this is where the magic really, really happens with Immersive Reader. If you want to see something differently, you go to View. My, uh, my manager told me that on day three of the job and I can't get out of my head. If you want to see it differently, go to View. We're trying to teach your pupils, if they want to see something differently, they go to View. And then under View, you have the Immersive Reader. If I give it a click, what now happens is it's now pulled into the Immersive Reader view. If you see, this is my edit view. When I go into Immersive Reader, I can start doing some really clever things to make this far more accessible and inclusive for pupils within my classroom. Now, if I'd have printed this off on a document, that is the way that pupil has to consume the information. When I give it to them in a digital format through their notebook, they now have the unbelievable ability to tweak this to exactly the preference they have. This can now be accessed the way that they wish to access it. So I'll show you a few of the features. So within the text size, I now have the ability to change the text size, make it nice and large. If I've got somebody with a visual impairment or a visual difficulties, I can increase the size of it to make it far easier to read. Now increasing the spacing, reduce the visual crowding. At the moment, if this was a screen in front of me and I'm a pupil that currently finger reads, it's going to be very, very hard to follow which word. I'm going to click on increase spacing, automatically space between the lines, space between the words. I can also change my font. Comic Sans is not my favourite font in the world, but I must say, that A there, I've never ever written an A like that in my life. So when I'm trying to teach a five or a six year old how to read, why am I showing them A's that look nothing like the A's that they have been waiting for to write with? If I change it to Comic Sans, it's now a very, very friendly looking A, the way that we teach children to form their minds. I can then start putting in different themes and page colours. Now, depending 
on uh, on the difficulty or the difference that the child has. They may much prefer reading things with a blue background or a yellow background. For me personally, and I don't have dyslexia, and as far as I'm aware, I don't have a learning difficulty at all. For me, my eyes get incredibly tired when I'm reading, reading black text on a white background. It's just not good for me. I much prefer reading it like this. And that's the way we need to think about this in most reading functionalities. It's not about people with differences or difficulties or disabilities. This is a preference piece. This is something that I prefer to read like this, so I have it just like that. I can then go into the grammar. Anybody here teach English? Anybody teach English to 7 to 11 year olds? Fantastic, okay? So when you're trying to teach parts of speech, and you're trying to teach the cat sat on the mat, and you're teaching them about verbs and nouns and how things interact, that is not going to engage your students. But, pull any piece of text into OneNote. You can pull it from the internet if you wish. You can pull it from another document. Pull it from wherever you want. You drop it into, into your OneNote, and you turn on these learning tools and the immersive reading functionality, you can start tweaking it. So I've now clicked on the nouns and the adjectives. Well, it's now done, power of the cloud, it's had a look through, it's found everything within this document that is a noun and highlighted it the color that I want it to be. It's now done the same with the adjectives as well. So now what you can do is you can pull Fortnite Season 7 update notes off the internet, chuck them into the immersive reader, and now you can teach verbs and adverbs through that. What is the way that you want to engage your nine-year-olds? Cats sitting on mats or things that they desperately want to read themselves? I can also turn on the labels as well so they can see. Now for me, this means that I can now provide my students with a learning resource that really focuses on what they want to do. I can also turn on the syllable breakdown. English is a wonderful language, but unfortunately, phonetically, it's quite tricky. Now if you show them a word such as atmosphere, show that to a seven, six or seven year old, they're gonna really struggle to read it. If you turn on that syllable breakdown and you show them that it's actually been broken down into its confirmed, confirmed pieces, what they're now going to be able to do is have a much better chance of decoding it, which means much less chance of them asking you to come and help them, which means they have empowerment over their own learning. They can take autonomy and they can really be the drivers of their learning. But this is what's new at the moment. This is something that's unlikely that many of you have seen, unless you've seen me present this over one of the other days. But this is now the translation functionality that we have. The picture dictionary I'm going to come back to. This translate functionality is incredibly powerful. This is a document that's currently in English. Hands up, who's got someone who has English as an additional language, or English as a second language, or is it a native English speaker? Almost all of us. We've got incredibly diverse classrooms. Some of us are here from international schools where they're learning multiple languages at the same time. This is an unbelievable feature. You can now translate by word or by entire document at the click of a button. So for example, can I have somebody here with the first language that isn't English volunteer their language for me? Don't be shy. Finish. Got some wonderful languages thrown out. Someone chose Klingon earlier, that was good fun. Okay, this is in Finnish now. So what I can now do is if I click on a word, rivers, it now gives me the ability to have that word read to me in English, which isn't plugged in, and it also gives me the ability to have it read to me in Finnish as well. There are other pieces of document out there that can just translate an entire block of text. If we're trying to teach children English, then we don't want them to then resort to their mother tongue the second they find a stumbling block. What we want them to be able to do is just remove that stumbling block. And if it's just that one word in the paragraph that's tripping them up, just having the ability to click, see it in their native tongue, or have it read to them in their native tongue, they're going to continue within that paragraph. It's just a tiny little stumbling block that's then removed and you enable their learning. And this is something that doesn't involve you doing anything. This is you empowering them to take ownership of their own learning and to remove the barriers that they see in front of them. Alongside this, the thing that I absolutely adore, my background I taught in special educational needs for a while, the picture dictionary by Boardmaker. Hopefully you know of Boardmaker, but now if I was to click on rivers, what it's now showing me is it's showing me a pictorial representation of the word, which means now if you've got somebody who maybe has absolutely no idea what that word means anyway, they can now click it. Now obviously when we start getting too slightly complicated, well atmosphere's actually in there, that's a shock. Okay, processes, goodness gracious me, okay, they've updated Boardmaker as well. Now there's all these words, they've got visual representations, and this is going to be really, really useful for students that are unable to access it. The line focus is also a fantastic tool. If you start putting huge blocks of text in front of people that do not like reading, the first thing they're going to go is go, mm, nope, not at all. If you turn this feature on and they can just take it line by line, then they're eating the elephant one bite at a time and it's a far easier way for them. And then alongside that, reading is obviously incredibly important. It's something that we all have to do as educators to make sure our pupils are prepped and ready for life. But if we just want them to access that information, 
that we shouldn't force them to read it. If we want them to just access the information and know what the lesson's about, I can just click play, and what it will then do is it's going to read that document aloud to me in the language that I've got it set in. It's reading that with synchronized highlighting on each word as it's being read. But not only that, if I go into my language settings again and I decide that I'm going to translate the entire document to Finnish, I think I may have made a mistake here, let's see. No, I haven't. This is now reading it to me in Finnish, read aloud. What I now have the ability to do, I can slow it down. If there's a sensory processing disorder, then what we can do is we can slow this down to half the speed. So they don't even have to read that document. And what we're now talking about, if you were working in a classroom that looks a bit like this, where you've got a device in front of each student, there's absolutely no way any other student's going to know how that person is accessing the information. You could be accessing it with absolutely none of these features turned on whatsoever. You could just be reading the text exactly as it stands. And then you can have somebody sat on the front who's very, very new to the English language and has a visual impairment. What they're now having it done is they're now having it read to them into their mother tongue. That is a way of opening your classroom up to let these people access it. The thing that I really want to hammer home about why this is so important is Office is something that's used throughout the world, throughout so many industries. Yes? I'm going to show you something marvellous. So the question was, is this a document that I have to create now in OneNote? Is this text that I have to put into OneNote myself? Is this something that has to be in OneNote? No. You can just insert something with text and I'm going to show you an absolutely magical feature that I think is going to be really, really helpful for you. So I'll quickly show this and then I'm going to come to it. So this is the immersive reader. And what we have is we have a load of different languages. What we have the ability to do is if we turn this on, what it's going to do, I am going to plug in the headphones for this one because it's marvellous. What this is now going to do is it's automatically going to recognise the language that this is written in and then it's going to read it in that language. If you would let me turn it up. Yeah, I'm trying to say it's what again. But if you see, if you see, there we go. But what it does is it realizes if it's a if it's a language that's read left to right, it reads it left to right. If it's a language that's read right to left, it reads it. And it automatically recognizes those languages and it reads it appropriately. But coming back to do I need to create this in OneNote? Absolutely not. Hands up here who knows about Office Lens as an app. Not a huge number of people. Office Lens is a fantastic app for, for mobile devices. It's available on the Google Play Store. It's available on the iOS App Store. I suggest that you download it the second I stop moving my lips. It is a fantastic way of capturing information and it is built by Microsoft to integrate unbelievably well with OneNote. This is a book. I'm sure you can tell. This is just a page from a book. Yeah, I'm about to do that. So it's just been had a photo taken of it on the on the Office Lens app. What it's done is it's realized that it's a document. It's then used optical character recognition. So what it's now done is it's looked and it's seen, oh, there's writing on this page. I reckon they'll probably want to know what that writing says. So what I can now do is if I right click on the app, on the picture, I can now copy the text straight out of the picture and paste it. Which means I can now take any form of written document that's put in front of me, I am then able to get all of the text from the analog world, bring it straight to the digital world, and manipulate it as I see fit. But I don't even need to go that far. If you've got an old worksheet that you created 15 years ago that just isn't currently accessible for a pupil who's Polish and is a uh, visual impairment in your class, take a picture of it in Office Lens, export it to your OneNote, it's going to take two taps of your thumb, and then the second that they click on Immersive Reader, is automatically going to bring that analog text that's completely inaccessible to them, and now they can start tweaking it and playing with it in a way that suits them and their learning style best. This is an unbelievable result. What I would also say is, I know we're late into the vet show now, but if you are taking pictures of screens, use Office Lens. You could take a picture from there, it would realize exactly what it is you're trying to take a picture of, it would, somebody's just done it. It will automatically crop to the exact screen size. Not only that, it will also morph and transform the image to make it completely square as if you were sat right in the middle, right to the front. Feel free to try it throughout the day. The other thing that's fantastic, and it wouldn't work for me because my handwriting is absolutely appalling, but if your handwriting is borderline legible, which as educators we should have it, this is handwriting. If I go onto the immersive reader, it realizes this is handwriting, it then does 
a very, very good job of figuring out what it is that's written. So now you can go from doing handwritten notes and a pupil can now go on an immersive reader and they can now have your handwritten notes that you have written on the page at 10 o'clock after the last mile there. And what they can now do is they can now see the letters this big with a blue background and translate it to Polish and have pictorial representations underneath it. And all of this happens is what happens when you start using OneNote as the place where you do all of your digital learning for your pupils. It is incredibly powerful. I encourage you to start poking around and having as much of a play with it as you possibly can. The last few bits and pieces I want to show you, and this is kind of leading into other people's sessions. Is anybody here using Teams? Because whilst we are all currently using the Windows 10 app or the 2016 app, you can just access OneNote online. And Office 365 is free for educators and students, and it is an unbelievable thing that you can access. It isn't going to take a huge amount of bandwidth. If you're going on here, you can start accessing it through a browser directly onto the OneNote site, but also if you do it through Teams. When you start integrating OneNote and the class notebook with your Teams, you have a huge ability to collaborate with other uh, teachers, collaborate with other pupils. There are team sessions running throughout tomorrow. I believe there's one a little later on as well. No, 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 there was one earlier on. Mr. Crawford in the Purple Cape does a wonderful session. I do suggest if you're here tomorrow, you do your best to see it. But using Teams alongside uh, the OneNote app is an unbelievable way to integrate everything that you do in a classroom and make your learning experiences far more collaborative for your pupils. It's been wonderful to speak to you about OneNote. Uh, the time I spent in the classroom, I had absolutely no interaction with OneNote whatsoever. I had no idea. It took me leaving the classroom and joining Microsoft to, to realize all the wonderful things that I've been missing out on. What I would encourage you to do is, any resource you're creating, just put it in OneNote. Watch the worst that can happen. You can really transform the way that your students access information. My Twitter handle is just there. Please do reach out to me if you have any queries or questions. I'll be lurking in this area. Please come and grab me and say hello and uh, enjoy the rest of your better experience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much there, Callum. A round of applause. Thank you so much, audience. That marks the end of this particular...